Dearly beloved, we are gathered here to celebrate the life of water. He was a good friend. Indeed, many of us were made up by him. Water will always be part of us. It's a dreadful shame that, as a result of the fire, water is gone. He will be missed. Greetings, strangers, queer and pleasant. I'm not Laura Kate Magnetdale. And I'm not Jane Iris Magnetdale. And welcome to another episode of Queer and Pleasant Strangers. It's a podcast where two queer trans women, that's us, we're wifey types, we have a bit of a catch up of media we've consumed in the week and catch do up. silly. So g- no, catch up. Uh-huh. We do silly voices and skits and just have a bit of a, a silly little catch up about our weeks. We do. How are you doing? I'm way better now I don't have a camera up my nose. You had a camera up your nose today. Had a camera up the nose, and I only gagged twice. Well done. And Impressive. only when they were like, make an ah sound, I was like, there's a camera in my throat. <laughs> Don't make me change, like, the open or closeness of my, like, respiratory system right I w- now. I was fine with the e sound. As soon as they were like, do an ah, I was like, ah, oh. Oh dear, oh dear. Oh no. I thought my gag reflex was fine, but <laughs> oh. apparently not. They didn't. They didn't even give me any like any any kind of um, anaesthetic. They just lubed me up, and I was just Ooh. like, "This is going to be uncomfortable." Okay, <laughs> thanks. But apparently, I have some great folds. Wow. Well, well, you know what else is is great? Maybe is it things that we've played? It might be things we've played this week. What are you What are you played this week? Uh, we played a thing together. What did we play together? We played Apiary. Yeah, we did. Uh, it's a game about bees in space. It is. It's it's a little worker placement, but it's space bees. But they're worker worker bees. Yeah. Uh, so the 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 idea is that um the the humanity has gone. They we just, don't. We don't know what happened. Yeah, they they are not on Earth anymore. One assumes they, you know, buggered off off of the planet and spaceships or whatever. But and and the bees were the next species to rise to dominance. Yeah, we we got sentient uh, planet ruling bees that yeah. learned how to make spaceships. Yeah, and they're they're flying around flying around in space in their in their little colony yeah. ships and bringing life to other planets and and looking for fiber and water and pollen. And um, eventually, um, hibernating, I guess, seems to be the point of yeah. the thing. Um, yeah, it's, it, as you say, it's a, a crunchy little worker placement game. Yes. So, like many worker placement games, there is a limit to how long you can spend doing your little engine building. Yes. Uh, and the limit here is, uh, all of, all of your actions will eventually lead to your bees, uh, leveling up. Yes. Uh, and, and that will allow them to do, uh, more, e- either like, do an action more times, or do a higher level action, or sometimes get a bonus for being a high level for doing an action, mm. and they're consistently being leveled up by things like, um, if you recall all of your bees so that you have, like, a fresh batch of workers, they'll all level up, and if you're already on a space and, you know, there's no open spaces and someone wants to go there, they'll push your bee off and then level it up. Which is interesting for worker placement, because usually it's a case of, well, the space has been taken, therefore you can't have it. Yes. But in this it's, you can have it, but you will be shortening the game, or just giving someone some sort of an advantage. Yeah, you'll be powering up the other player's bee and giving them a worker back with the, without them having to spend a turn doing the recall action. Yes. And that can be really valuable. Uh, but if a bee is at like level four, it's max level and it would level up. They they retire. They go into into, they hibern- go into hibernation. Yeah, they go into hibernation. You get and... a one time bonus for doing yeah. for going there. But there's also like a whole area control aspect there because yes. there's a couple of different spaces within the hibernation comb, and they uh, whoever has like the most uh, hibernating bees in a particular spot will uh, get a, a a point bonus for for having gone there. Yes, and the, that hibernation, you'll be like leveling up to level four and then trying to level up again, is the thing that dictates the pace of the game. Um, that'll use up a hibernation token. There's a limited number of them and a limited number of places they can go. Yes. Um, hibernation also means that you will have one fewer worker to work with and you will have to get them back out as a new level one worker by doing actions Mm -hmm. which means that like raising the level of your bees is a risk reward process yes because like level four bees are great at like 
getting really powerful bonuses or being able to do actions that no other level can do. Hmm. But by getting them up to level four, you risk going back down in how many workers you have to work with. Yes, and you really don't want to have too many workers off the board at a time. Yes. Now, we played two two games of this back-to-back, and the first game was very much a, there are a lot of different places on the board to go, and we're just sort of trying to understand it. But at the end of it, we were both sat there and we had like a 15, 20 minute conversation of like, ah, oh, these are the things I think I should have done better than these things I've noticed about this. And we immediately like restarted, played a whole new game. We had uh, new ships because mm. uh, everyone starts with a ship board, uh, a new faction. There are five basic factions to start with. And then there's a whole bunch of like yeah. regular factions that you can get into once you've learned the game a and bit more. The basic ones are usually things like build this kind of hex next to, like, your faction hex and you'll get some bonus points at the end of the game. Yes. Your, your default ones. Um, yeah, there's not too many specific choices to pick from in terms of, like, things you can do on a turn. Yeah. It's, well, it's not one of those, like, overwhelming worker placements where you've got, like, a dozen different things you could be doing. It's like, there's a little board where you go around exploring space to gain resources. Yep. Yeah, get- and every time you go to a new place, you'll be revealing a new planet if there isn't one there already, and potentially like saying this planet is known for having fiber. Yeah. And if there's a little like dotted outline space, you can add a little fiber token so to it. So you can sort of control what resources it's going to give you and later players. Yeah, and you will get whatever that is, uh, whatever's shown on the on the um, tile, mm-hmm. plus anything uh, that was uh, that is uh, that you've added. Plus the token, any rewards for the token that you picked up during the explore. Uh, But if there's like more than one little dotted outline, the next person to go there can be like, I have also discovered, say, pollen or or water on this planet. Uh, So that's just sort of like one of your big ways of getting resources. You've got um, basically a store for three different types of hexes you can put on your ship. Yeah. uh, And they come in like farm which is a place to store resources, because any resources you get from that first place, you have to put somewhere on your ship, and, like, you know, the farm will be like, this farm has spaces for pollen. And, like, you see so you've got spaces to put things. But also, it's um, when you do the recall action, when you're recalling your yes. workers, all of those farms will have a... Here is, a, a like, an income thing you can get when you have to do that action. Yeah. Uh, the second kind of hex you can get is... When blank do blank, uh, ongoing effects, yep. which will be things like um, permanently reduce the cost of this type of tile, or any time that you um, uh, do the explore action, gain a free this resource. Uh, and the last one is one time effects, where it's like you buy the hex and it does a thing right now, and that's it done. Yes, but and- also they tend to be worth individual like more points than any other um, yeah. hex the farms aren't worth very much those single use effects are worth a few more victory points yeah well there is, there is another type of hex but you have to go to a whole different spot for that oh yes that's and the, you have uh, to be a level four that's, yes, the, that's carve. The, the carvings which uh, are generally like very high value point scorers yes so carve is supposed to be the like y- your uh, um your uh hive i guess these are the things of, of the great art that they have created, or the or the, yeah. the the things to be the monuments to be left behind. These are the things they carve. They, they are where the big point scoring potential feels like it is in in some ways. They they are where like you're sort of, uh, you know, you might get one that's like every single farm is worth two victory points, mm. or like a victory point for every tile uh, uh, hex you you've got in your ship. Yes, um, and given that your starting faction will usually have something like. Um, have adjacent farms or have adjacent um, yeah. uh, like researcher type things um, like if you can also get the carving yeah. that fits in with that there is a potential for get, like getting a, yeah. a, a huge combo there um, there is a place you can go to swap resources for other resources yep. be it cards or in uh, types of basic um, resources yep. of, of the water fiber or pollen yep, can... or turning those into wax or honey yeah but also dances dances because they're bees and they communicate by dancing they do so you can make if if you send a level four bee there you can create Teach a, a dance. dance uh yes which will 
you will have some control of what thing you spend and what thing you create. Yes, so that at the start of the game you'll shuffle out some of these um uh dance tiles and they will be like like a like a mad libs type thing of yeah. fill in the gap. Some of them will have like bits already printed on them, but some of them will be like the dance of blank and blank for blank. Yeah. Um so it's like in you fill in uh say you want to put like fiber and uh a victory point mm. and you'll get one queen's favor for example. Yeah. You can sort of create your own like custom I have excess of pollen and water in this game and I'm finding it really hard to get wax. I'll uh make a dance that mm. changes between those or something. Oh yes. Um and then there is the 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 seeds, uh, the seed cards that you sort yes. of alluded to, which is uh, cards that have one-time use, like activatable effects. Yep. Or they can be planted on your board to be point-scoring victory conditions for the end of the game. Or you can toss them things. away for a regular um, resource. Yeah. There's quite a lot you can do with them, um, yeah. depending on like what level worker you send to that space. That's how many. Um, cards you can draw but you only get to keep one of them yes there are a bunch of other ways through like exploration or um the certain tiles that will let you get cards yeah and that will mean that there's like a good chance that you'll be able to select through them but um yeah it's i i feel like cards is the one i've explored least but seems to have like a ton of of stuff to be discovered it, therein. It does indeed. Um, and it all sort of comes together to... Like, there's not, like, a huge number of places to go. And each one of them, you only have, like, a little handful of choices. But it's uh, it's one of those, those worker placements where it's like... It's very easy to go, I'm going to do this this turn. And then agonise over the specifics for a minute. Yes. Because it, it's it's nice that because um, your uh, your desired place won't ever be like completely taken away from you yes but the way you use it might change a little bit before your turn comes back and and yeah. that's less of a problem in two player but there there were times when i was like i really hope you don't do an explore it's... because there's two spots uh for workers on explore and the amount of movement movement you can do is the combined level of both players or, or both workers yeah. that are in that spot and if there's only one worker in that spot, then it's it's just that single value. But I was like, if you've got a level four there, you've got a level four there, I've got a second. Hopefully you won't put another thing and nudge that level four off, and I'll get to use that before yeah, it. There, there are some things another player can snipe you on, like um, if someone explores an unexplored area before you get a chance mm -hmm. to and picks up the tile on it, or someone buys that farm that you had just enough resources to purchase and it's going to be <laughs> perfect for you. There's a few things that can get sniped. But fundamentally, like, it, it feels like it has a lot less of that. Uh, I've waited for my turn to come around and I know exactly what I'm going to do. I know exactly, I know exactly, oh, you went there and now my turn's ruined. You that, can do it, but it won't necessarily be exactly what you'd hope. Yeah, it, it, it happens a lot less frequently. There's a lot less stepping in each other's way. Yes, but or in, at least to, like, to such yeah. a strong degree that you, a, you get in a lot of worker placement games. But in a way that doesn't feel like it's not you're not interacting. Like, you are no. playing the same game as each other. Yeah, I mean, and, and especially with, with the explore action, because one of the, the, or one of the primary rules of this explore action is you don't have to use all of your movement for moving the, the ship around on that little grid, but you can't end on the same space that it started on. So if there is one planet that gives you, like, one of each of the three primary resources, and somebody was like, oh yeah, I'm just going to go, um, I'm going to pop over there on my turn, you can't, that is when you could just go, well, I might as well explore somewhere else, because I definitely cannot get this great reward of the th mm. one of each of the three uh, basic things, um, which is a really interesting idea. Um, yeah. yeah, I... I I'm looking forward to playing this on higher play accounts. It's done that uh, thing like Tapestry, where you have a, a two-sided board, and one side is for uh, one to three players. Mm -hmm. So this is a Stonemaier Games production, and it has an automa in it for single player. That looks fairly easy to run. I think it, it looks like not dissimilar to... Um, yeah, not dissimilar to something like Tapestry. Again, ta yeah. Again, Tapestry. Um, the worker ships. I want to quickly talk about the worker ships. So there's, um, is plays one to five players. 
the worker ships are these little sort of cube bees. Cubies. <laughs> yeah. Um, and they have like a number on either side and whichever side is, is face up, that is the, um, that is the, the strength of that worker. And they are obviously come beautifully in, in five different colors, but also they've got a lovely little wash. So they've got real personality and, and I guess giving it a wash is, is a, a really easy way of being able to go basically molded the whole thing in one color. But you can still pick out what the number is. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's it's really lovely. It's quite a lovely game. It is. I'm uh, excited to play more. Yes. Um. Yeah. And as as I started and then just ADHD'd out of. <laughs> uh. Yeah. So you've got two two sided boards. Um. One side for four and five player. Haven't really looked at like that that yet. Yeah. But I haven't had a, an, any great need to. I know that changes some of the mechanics quite strongly. Yeah. Because there's four spaces on the acquiring tiles area. Mm. One is, ju- uh, or two of them are just for getting farms, and the other two are for just getting the other two types of tiles. Yeah. Which is um, really interesting, I think. And also there's like a much bigger uh, hibernation comb. Mm. Um, for two player, there's, uh, the hibernation comb is a specific size, and there's like a, that you only use this other little segment of the comb if you are um, playing in three player and so yeah I think they've done a good job of like balancing it for different player counts without needing like a huge number of extra components or anything like that it's a it's a lovely box it's easy to put things away yeah. I just wish there had been some explanation of this is how we think you should put the game away like I uh, worked it out after setting up for the first time yeah but like the like it's not it wasn't immediately obvious it wasn't and, intuitive to look at and go i see where everything goes yeah and i we had a similar problem with um expeditions mm. although it had very obviously shaped spaces for things like the big hexes and it named all of the um the big mechs because mm. it was like these are the big mechs um here is the name of them all just cuz you probably won't know them necessarily by name and it might be hard to tell from the beautiful art yeah because it's a bit a bit more stylized or or drawn as like partly behind trees or whatever because it's supposed to be a giant mech Mm. um that box again came with no real instructions for this is how it is supposed to be because Mm. it's like hey you can you can move things about a bit if you want if you want to do that thing you can put things in different places and part of me is just like no i want rigid rules about where the (laughs) things go in the box yeah um but yeah like i've I've worked it out it's it's a lovely box it's the standard board game box size which i appreciate um it was another one of those games i ordered ages ago completely forgot about and then um it was like oh i finally hit release date cool yeah um, yeah, I, I love all the artwork. I love all the bees in, in their little space helmets. It's adorable. It's very, very charming. Mm-hmm. Well, what else have you played? Well, I can talk about a game that I have. I certainly haven't finished, but I've been enjoying in a baffling way what I've <laughs> experienced of so far. I've been playing Alan Wake 2. Ah. So... Uh, to, to sort of summarize the plot of the first Alan Wake that came out, I think 13 years ago, I think it was 2010. What? Um, Alan Wake is the story of a writer who is basically just Stephen King, who decides like, hey, I'm, I've got terrible writer's block. I'm having a really hard time writing my gritty horror detective novel, whatever it is, series. Uh, I'm just gonna go. I'm to going work. to Maine. I'm gonna go to Maine because it's a Stephen King. Um, I'm gonna go there with my wife and just be in a cabin and not think about writing for a week. And his wife brings a typewriter and goes, "Hey, I know you said you didn't want to write, but maybe you want to write because we're somewhere else." And then she vanishes, and he is suspected of kidnapping Murder. her. Um, long story short, um. This town is inhabited by an evil entity that is basically like, hey, are you having trouble creating? Um, I can help you, I can be your muse, but I will imbue dark magic that will make your stories come to life. Ooh. And Alan Wake ends up in hell because he's a horror writer and the only compelling end to a story he can think of is is a horror one, because that's how he is. Alan Wake 2... Um, is fucking bonkers. Yes. Um, I 
I'm not that far in, I'm maybe four or five hours in, but here is what I can, spoiler light, tell you about this game. You are playing as a pair of detectives, neither of whom I am convinced is real, who are trying to solve a series of ritual cult murders that all have to do with, like, pages of Alan Wake's writing are showing up, and they're worshipping Alan Wake's writing as a cult, and you got to go, you, you, these FBI agents going to go solve these cult murders, and it sure seems like Alan Wake is maybe trying to write himself back into reality from hell by writing a horror story in which he is the leader of a cult trying to bring him back, because he's a horror writer and he cannot conceive of writing a story that is not... The word th that isn't just going to lead to terrible things for him. He's got so much depth, he, so much, yeah. so much versatility. Here's the thing: there's a lot of things about this game where I'm like, by the end of this game, I'm either going to think it is amazingly or terribly written, <laughs> and it is entirely going to hinge on an assumption I have made, which I, I have, I need to talk about Saga, the playable female FBI agent who is your like main starting playable character who has a mind palace and is... There's no other way to put it. She is BBC Sherlock in terms of the deductions she is making. Yes. There is a point where she meets two people who witnessed a murder and she's asking them questions about like, oh, you saw the, the, the ritual cult thing going on. And she sits and profiles them in her mind palace and imagines them having a conversation about having stolen a necklace off of the corpse that was shaped like a tree, so she confronts them about it, and they did indeed steal a necklace shaped like a tree off of the corpse. A thing that Saga would have no... There was no clue that led to a necklace having existed, there was no clue that they'd stolen anything, she just fucking magically knew it. And I'm like, that is frustrating and terrible writing, dot dot dot, unless what I suspect is happening. Alan Wake is writing her actions, he is controlling her actions by having written them in advance, and he is a bad writer who does not know how to write detectives, uh, because he went in. He went to hell in 2010, which was about when BBC Sherlock was happening. Ah. And I'm like, is that your touchstone for what detectives are? And you're like, I gotta write a detective. Um, she she does a mind palace, and she knows. Like, so much of my feelings about this game hinge on how Alan, serious are they? About Alan this? Wake in universe. <laughs> Being a terrible writer who is the reason for some of these choices. Because if that's what's going on, it's fucking genius. If that's not what's going on... Oh dear. Oh. So, yeah, this game is, like, fascinating and weird. Um, it, it plays kind of straight-faced with, like, a little bit of supernatural, um, otherworldly weirdness. It's when you get, like, maybe three hours in that it starts getting weirdly Twin Peaks... Right. And like, Good. Excellent. Love that. Here's the thing. Alan Wake has always kind of been a bit Twin Peaks, particularly with the DLC for the first game, American Nightmare, in which Alan Wake What's is... What's that DLC? I thought that was a standalone. Uh, maybe it was a standalone. It was the sort of continuation of okay. Alan Wake 1, whatever. Um, the thing about that is Alan is trapped in a, in a, in another, in a weird other world, while a doppelganger of himself gets back out into reality and uh -huh. starts doing a bunch of killings. Right. And I'm like, yeah, I see... I see, I see an evil coop in there somewhere. Yeah, you see the, the Twin Peaks happening here. Yeah. Oh, you're trapped in the other world for like a couple dec... like a decade plus, while evil you is out in the world. Um, I think maybe he undoes that, it's unclear. Um, but yeah, Alan Wake 2 doubles down on the... Um, on some of the more Red Room elements. Excellent. Um, and it gets funky. I've not reached it yet, but I saw like two seconds of a clip on, on Twitter of a musical sequence that's at some point going to happen that I am excited and baffled by. Excellent. Um, Alan Wake 2 is a lot, and I wouldn't want anything else from this game. <laughs> I wouldn't want it to be anything less than... I, I want to be like torn between hating it and loving it until it ends, and then I go, "This is the best thing I've ever played." <laughs> like I want it to be that that r like right up until the finish line. I don't know if I'm gonna hate it, and then I walk away just going, "Yeah, that was fucking wild." Because we know they can write a decent story. We played Control. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so I will have more to say about Alan Wake Two when I have gotten further into it. But right now, it's beautiful theory crafting territory. Um, 
What about you? What else have you played this week? Uh, I played through A Man of the Adventure, which we talked about a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, you did. This is that, uh, uh, um, well, uh, Dora the Explorer-esque horror VHS experience. Kind of. Kind if of. Dora the Explorer was p- public access yeah. and, like, 3D animated in that style of early 2000s two shiny characters. Yeah, a little, little bit reboot. Uh, a little bit reboot, a little bit edutainment mm. like the the fact that the mouse cursor is this like adorable blue friend with little yeah. eyes despite it reminds me of like humongous games type yeah. things despite being a vhs the the visual is like our computer can do 3d now yes yeah uh, we we do early 3d video gamey yeah like the the there seems to be a whole thing of this recently of people doing like I want to do VHS horror, but they don't know how VHS works. But work. I either they don't know how it works or they deliberately are I, like jamming all of the nineties oh, things into I, one. I wish I knew the name of this, but I watched a YouTube video a couple of weeks ago specifically about um, this wave of art that is happening about like analog horror from. People too young to have grown up with, with like VHS, for example. Yeah. And the weird, um, uh, ways that they sort of play with that, that medium and like the, 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 the not quite understanding how the medium works. I mean, the fact that when you press pause in this game and the video pauses dead still on one <laughs> frame. <laughs> um, yeah, because the thing is, is like, we, I don't have the name of the video here, so I'm not going to be able to like point to it. Uh, but the, the 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 gist of it was certain early video game representations of VHS media have led to people mimicking what they saw in those video games and like as their reference, not the original yes. media format, and that has led to some interesting things propagating. Yes, which this definitely has a bit of. Yes, it really does. Um, now it's. It does horror interestingly. It does creepy really well. Um, yes, but also like there's there's a lot lot of like basic puzzle solving, and it is such basic puzzle solving that at several points I was massively overthinking things. Yeah, yeah. like one of the first puzzles is you watch a video and the characters are like, "We're gonna make a pie." And you watch the video, and like, is that okay? So the things we know are that you get an apple, you cut up the apple. There's flour at some point, yeah, because uh, you're asked to find the flour. You're told for how long and at what temperature the pie yeah. needs to cook. And then when the video ends, you are like spat back into this like attic space, and behind you on a table is like an easy bake type oven with a digital display on it, yeah, uh, a whole bunch of fruit. A, uh, a like a pie pan with a, a hole rusted through it, <laughs> and it's like okay, like well, I know to set the the temperatures, and um, I'm looking for a, a, a apple. Fine, there's an apple on the table, and I had seen another fruit that I had thought in the dark was also an apple, but it turned out it was a peach. <laughs> Um, cause I was looking for like, well, there's got to be a couple of apples and I'm going to have to find, try and find the thing. And I was getting really frustrated with it. People in chat were like, I've seen you solve puzzles way harder than this. Yeah. Um, and I listened to that as you're overthinking it. And I was overthinking it. And the answer was just put apple in pie pan, set oven to correct temperature and time and put um, yeah. Unpeeled, uncut apple yeah. into into uh, oven. The the puzzles are testing for. Did you pay attention to the like the numbers and the basic gist more than it is like actually trying to? Yes, and after that, yeah. like things got way easier. Yes. Um. There there was a couple of things of just like finding finding something, getting little bits of information. Sometimes you, uh, I was finding that like I wasn't like at the right time or I hadn't like paused the video at, at a particular time mm. and done some interaction that I apparently needed to um I got through the whole thing I saw all, all the yeah. endings I got all of the um the all five law videos or four law four law videos however many mm. it was um like I've seen all of the different endings and there are several although I did think uh, I, again I overthought the end credits yeah. Because there's a whole thing of if you haven't seen all of the lore videos, 
you won't need to see all the credits because otherwise that will spoil things for you. Yeah. And at first I was like, ah, oh, there's like a cipher in in the credits, and I was tr like trying to get pictures of it, and then. As I got more of the law videos, I was like, ah, the cipher's changing. Oh, no, no. Oh, oh, it took me far too long <laughs> to finally realize, ah, no, all they were doing was hiding hiding yeah. the information you haven't seen yet. But I, I get it, you know, conventions of medium. Yeah, and the story that is un uncovered through that is quite fascinating. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, it's it's not bad. You see what I mean about, like... It's horror isn't nearly as, like, shock value gore horror as you might expect from a thing that is juxtaposing, like, colourful children's media. Yes. Like, the cheap way to go about it would be to, like, would be to very, be very, like, blood gore jump scare about yeah. it. Yeah. And it, l there's a little, but it's it largely plays more toward the, like, creepy, unsettling psychological or, like, this character performance of them being scared is unsettling. Yeah, it does like uh, stream horror decently well. Yeah. Um. And and I I I guess I didn't really know what to expect going into it, but um yeah, it's it's interesting and the the story gets pretty dark in 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 certain ways, and um yeah, all the weird back lore videos, the the robot. <laughs> the whole thing with the robot suddenly, like, just getting really chatty. The I won't say speaking spell bot. Yeah, I guess like a speaking spell, but it's yeah. only got numbers on the front of it. Um, like it, like there's various codes to decipher, and you type them into the robot, and the robot will say things related to that. Um, and if you get it wrong, it would just be like, I am not a calculator. <laughs> um, but yeah, like, there's a whole thing where you can, like, stand near it with a bottle of, uh, with a, with a bucket of water and it will start pleading for its life. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, that's dark. They, they <laughs> do a lot with a limited space and a limited number of, like, set designs. Yeah, they really do. But then there's, like, the, like, the lore videos are, like, fully acted out with people yeah. and... Um, yeah, it's, it's fascinating, but, um, yeah, I, I had a good time with it. Thank you for the recommendation. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you got on well with it. Yeah, I didn't do great on stream, but I did finish it that evening. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, what, what else, what else have you played? I have been getting very into Dave the Diver. Dave the Diver? Yeah, it's a game I've been, like, meaning to get around to, and it finally came out on Switch, and I'm like, okay, yeah, that's, that's reason enough for me to finally pick it up. Uh, so Dave the Diver is a game in which you play a guy called Dave who has been roped into, uh, because he likes sushi, he's been roped into going diving to get fish for a restaurant every day and then running back and forth, like, bringing food to the customers every day based on what he's, he's found while doing his diving. Mm -hmm. And uh, this game is charming. I understand why people love it. Um, Even though most of the people you meet at the start of the game are just dicks. There's a lot of people who will take advantage of your good nature, and we'll see where that goes. But the general flow of the game, and like, there's a lot of other mechanics that will layer on top of it, and I'll touch on some of those in a minute, but the general gameplay flow is, each day you can go diving twice. You have a capacity of how much stuff you can you can swim back up to the surface with. You can go a little above your capacity and, like, you'll swim slower but be fine. At a certain point, you just can't pick anything else up. Mm. Um, you, It's up to you, sort of, how you use your amount of air you have to uh, go find a bunch of different fish. Um, there will be things other than fish to find, like... Um, uh, pieces of scrap metal that you can use to make new new gear and bits uh, bits of treasure you can sell to make money to upgrade your diving equipment, which will let you dive deeper or have a bigger oxygen tank or a higher carrying capacity. And uh, you you can go do your dive basically as long as you have oxygen. Um, you can find additional oxygen while underwater sometimes by like finding discarded oxygen tanks uh, and hit making will take some oxygen off of you. Yeah, your oxygen tank also acts as your health meter, which isn't immediately a concern, but like later on, you might see a shark and it's going to have a lot of very good quality, valuable meat on it. But but it will also it, fuck you up. It's going to try and fuck you up. Um, and like. You you have you have a little knife. You could you might as I did today find a katana underwater and be like, yeah, I can use this. Uh, you or might a bring blunderbuss. yeah, you might bring a gun underwater to have a gun fight with a shark. Gun underwater. Um, and you sort of 
get to explore further and further uh, as you upgrade your stuff and also as quests might dictate. Uh, uh, you can do two of these dives per day and sometimes before a dive uh, an NPC will come and interact with you and like give you a little quest to do that might be go explore these ruins, go find this artifact, go uh, co uh, collect these shells and bits of coral for our ecology study. Um, things like that. Um, you might find that dolphin again. You might find that dolphin that's constantly getting caught by pirates and have to go save the dolphin again. Um, and I will say the early hours of this game, like it is const, like it is constantly throwing new mechanics, new things at you, introducing new stuff, but not in an overwhelming pace. Because at the very least, you'll have probably a fifteen-minute dive before there is a chance for another NPC to come introduce mm. something new to you. So it's like it, it feels like good for ADHD. Yes, in that respect. it's walking that line pretty well. Um, the other half of the game is restaurant management you are uh once you get back to the re the uh, the sushi restaurant at night you have to decide what items are going to go on the menu today and uh that will change depending on what fish you have available that you've managed to get in stock and then you've got to uh decide if you're going to hire new staff and what roles in the restaurant you're going to have them do and then you've got to run back and forth uh, pouring people green tea with a little mini game and grabbing people's plates and running them back and forth. And sometimes there'll be VIPs that want very specific meals and maybe you'll have a couple of days to like find the ingredients for them. And then you're back in the ocean and doing more diving. Um, it's a very compelling gameplay loop. It is one that I have really felt get its hooks in me and I, I understand the appeal a lot. Um, I like that it's not hugely pressuring on time limits for, like, new things it introduces. It gives you plenty of time to do the things it wants you to do. Mm. Um, and generally, you can just kind of enjoy exploring the ocean. Um, it is a visually gorgeous game. Um, I am enjoying doing a lot of the, like, do all the little science research, collect all these things for science, science. Uh, quests. There is basically a Pokedex, but for fish. Mm-hmm. Um, Good the, for the completionist. Yep. Uh, there is definitely some uh, some supernatural and or sci-fi sci and or not quite what it seems narrative elements that I'm starting to unravel yeah. that are interesting. Yeah, like I've watched about four hours of Johnny DiCchiadini playing this and I was like, that looks fascinating. I hope there is a way of getting rid of the QTEs. You, I, I, I get the vibes that they might try and squeeze some like Echo the Dolphin type stuff in there. So I would not be surprised if there's... Not aliens in there at some point. Yeah, you can't turn QTEs off entirely, but you can change them from a button mash into a button hold, and it's a button you would be holding generally anyway. Uh, it, it largely solves that problem, which I, I was struggling with the QTEs a bit. They mm. were a bit demanding. Yes. Uh, for, for my tastes, I, I was not enjoying them. Mm. Um, but yeah, um, cutscenes when they happen are gorgeous. The, the, they're funny and amusing. These little animated really great pixel, uh, art. pixel art cutscenes, yeah. It is a very charming game, and I understand why everyone was so vocal about it when it came out. Mm -hmm. It is well worth playing. Um, uh, it is, the Switch port is a very good port. Um, if I were not recording this podcast right now, I would be playing more Dave the Diver. <laughs> uh, I'm having to fight the urge to play more Dave the Diver while we record. It's one of those. I'm like, I could, I could... I could go back down and try and find that guy's anime figurine so that he will build the thing for me that I need him to build. <laughs> it, it, a, a, ta a shipping container sunk in the ocean and his anime figurine's down there somewhere. somewhere. He will do a favour for me if I find his little figurine. It's, it was it was that or Garfield um, phones washing up on the wall. <laughs> oh, yes, that, that French <laughs> beach. Um, yeah, what about you? What else have you been playing? Uh, that's pretty much it for me. What else have you played? Uh, yeah, so I've started playing another game on Switch called Spin Rhythm XD. Uh -huh. Uh Which is a game that I picked up. I think it's because Indie Alpaca was doing TikToks about it. It looked pretty neat. So it is a music rhythm game where uh, you have... I'm trying to work out how to how to describe this in a way that will be understandable. You have almost like uh, the top of a uh, cylinder, and around it is a rotating band of alternating pink and blue uh, segments. 
and notes will sort of come down this sort of pipe towards you, and you have to rotate your little segment of alternating pink and blue, so mm-hmm. that, like, if a blue pip is coming down, the blue is in the right place that, like, you know, the blue pip will hit the blue on your, your rotated ring. Mm-hmm. Uh, same for, same for pink. Sometimes there will be, like, spin this way or spin that way, and sometimes there will be notes that you have to press the button as well as have the right colour in the right place. Mm. And it is really satisfying. Um, I don't know that I've played many good music rhythm games that are analog input focused. Usually they are, here is a digital button that has to be pressed on exactly the right point. Yeah. And there's a little bit of leeway in this because of the fact that it is, it is analog. Um, a lot of the pips that are coming towards you will be smaller than the segment of this alternating colour bar you're trying to rotate into place. Hmm. So you have like a bit of extra space to play with in terms of that accuracy. Um, there's a lot of little touches about how this is made that I really like. Um, one of which is, let's say I've been told to spin my little red and pink um, thing uh, to the right, and then at the end of it I'm going to start having some pink notes show up. Um, the first, if I press A when like the the spinning should end and the first pink note should be hit, it'll automatically put my little alternating ring so that pink is in the position it needs to be for that hit note. Mm. So at the end of a spin, you press press your button to like in in time, and you know that the right color is going to be exactly where you need it to be, and that makes it really easy to go from I am spinning out out of control like doing a spin to I am exactly where I thought I'd be, and I can like start weaving between those notes. Yeah. It is very, very satisfying. Um, I need to put more time into it. I put maybe like an hour into it today, but it is a very satisfying music rhythm game uh, that doesn't really control like anything else I've played. Um, it is nice that a game with analog input feels this easy to be precise with in this kind of setting. And I'm having a lot of fun with it. Yay. Uh, so that is, I think, everything I've played this week. Well, then. <gasps> Time for this. Right, right. Welcome, welcome, everyone. Welcome to this press conference. Um, now, I know why you're all here. Everyone's been asking us, Choco Corp, you pledged previously to stop bad practices within your chocolate making and you have done nothing to make things better. Mm. And we hear you loud and clear. Uh, we here at Choco Corp very sincerely believe in making things better and making you not angry at us anymore so you keep buying chocolate. Mm. So, we've been doing our best to try really hard to think about making our chocolate more ethically. Mm. Uh, we, we, we pledge to really, really, really think hard about maybe doing things better. Now, uh, there is, there, thank you, thank you. There, there is one thing we would ask for in exchange uh, for this new sort of uh, sustainability and not, you know, being terrible pledge that we have. No, 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 no. And all that we ask, and we think this is a very minor thing, mm-hmm. is because we we want uh, the chocolate regulating industry to give us one week notice, give us one week's notice before any visits to check up on us. You know, if you're going to go to, you know, one of our cocoa growing farms and Mm. check whether we have, you know, child workers or anything or people are being underpaid, give us a week's notice. Not because we're covering anything up. Mm. Uh, We're, 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 um, we're throwing a little party for the inspector. That's it. Mm. And we need time to get the party hats. So as long as you give us a week's notice so we can get the party hats in, we will promise to do trying better harder trying better at not being evil well i think that sounds very fair don't you uh, yeah. very reasonable yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Bravo, 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 bravo bravo it's the end of october the weather gets colder and the veil gets thin between worlds get discounts to die for on veil insulation and keep those terrifying chills at bay with our patented fiber gassed insulation perfect for keeping your forebears on the other side where you left them fiber gassed so thick you won't even notice that hell's frozen over so what have you put in your eyes what have i put in my eyes let's let's find a list um we watched uh we both watched a thing this week we did uh, 
We watched the pilot of The Amazing Digital Circus. A thing we watched we can talk about. Yeah, because it's, it's on YouTube. It's not made by one of those truck studios. In fact, it's not made by any studio right now. They're just yeah. trying to get it picked up. Yeah, so how would you explain The Amazing Digital Circus? Um, well, what if, uh, I mean, and I've never read or, or played the game for I Have No Mouth But I'm a Scream, that sort of, like, trapped inside a computer vibe. Um, yeah. But f- it, um, Gravity Falls meets I Have No Mouth But I'm a Scream. A little bit. It's, it's, it's a little bit, um, Hug, hug Me I'm Scared meets Looney Tunes. Yeah, I think Don't Hug Me works quite well because there's that whole thing of like the outside world but rather than in Don't Hug Me it being about marketing or, or whatever that show is actually about Yeah. Um, or, or growing up there is like a, a, a hey, I keep seeing fire exits and I will try to escape but that escape is also just a weird, yeah. dingy, rundown office with an old computer it's... that gives me real Stanley par- Parable vibes, but may also be in a weird recursion of itself that is also in something that the Ringmaster character keeps calling The Void. Yeah, it's a little bit severance in vibe in places. Yeah, um, because everybody's less lost their memories of their real lives. They don't know their own names. Yeah. So They're just, you have the avatar that you are given now that you live inside this computer. Yeah, so the, the gist, as best uh, it is summed up at the start, is um, our main character, who does not remember her name, but she's now going by Pomni, um, put on a headset at a computer somewhere, and now she is trapped in a world that is a. It's basically like a like a nineties edutainment game set in a circus. Is sort of the vibe. It's like we have the circus tent and the theme park and the lake. Like the like here are your like three environments to go to yes. kind of uh, thing. Uh, with a bunch of other people who also don't remember how they got there entirely. Or Some of them are. have abse- accepted that more than others. Yep. And, as you say, this ringmaster character who uh, is... Looks like they were made by Bethesda. <laughs> because it's uh, a pair of false teeth or t- a chattering teeth with eyeballs. Inside. Inside the mouth. Yes. Who comes up with like little adventures for them to stop them losing their mind at the abject terror of the fact that they cannot leave. Yes. Go collect all the gloinks. Um, Whatever that means. Yeah. It's. Uh, I, I, I think. But also, the thing might be breaking down because things from. Like, demonic things might try and come and yeah. kill you or. Like, glitch you out weirdly. It seems like if you let yourself uh, get lost to the existential despair of your situation, you might uh, very literally lose some of your reality in the process. Yes. But wacky, boink boink sound effects, rubber ho- 3D rubber hose animation, and... Yeah, it's... Aren't I wacky? Yeah, like, I... <sighs> I'm not sure who is going to pick this up, but I hope whoever does doesn't change the so change it too much. My, my understanding is the studio that did the like the team that did this have previously just self-funded doing their own things. Okay, so it it, it may well be a case of this if, ends up being a yeah. Stuff it seems like it's a if this is popular, we will push ahead with it. And okay, it got 36 million views in like a week, so I think. It's probably going to get a full run. Yeah, and I'm already seeing people on TikTok doing, like, deep dive breakdowns of yes, there's, what everything means and, and yeah. what the motivations of characters are. And There's a fascinating detail that I spotted watching it that second time with you, oh. where when you're going down the corridor of, like, everyone's bedrooms, yes. there is a queen uh, chess piece who is crossed out. Yes. Which might explain some of the king chess piece's um, behaviour. Yes, but also, like, seems to just, like, be constantly forgetting things. Yeah, it's... I I think they've done a good job of, like, balancing the wacky humour with the horror in a way where Neva feels too out of balance. Yes, but also I'm not sure this is for kids. Oh, no, 1000% not. No, not for children, (laughs) not for kids. Do not show this to children. (laughs) Like, I don't know how much of it would actually I think teens would probably be, bad be all right with that, for, Too bad for children, but... It's not high gore, but, no, like, it's, it's if ex- you really think about it, it's, it's quite... It's existential in a way that, like, <laughs> I imagine if you were, like, 12 might hit you quite hard. Yeah. 
Like, there's there's an age range where you would be old enough to think about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it is a very promising, uh, very promising one. Like, gorgeous use of 3D to do, like, a lot of animation work that usually you only see in 2D. Yes. And that is really interesting to see put together in 3D properly. Yes. Um, very well voice acted. Mm -hmm. A lot of good voice talent in it. Oh, yeah. Uh, it is a very promising thing that I hope gets more episodes, because it, it is weirdly fascinating. Yeah, more of that. Yeah. I'd love more of that. Uh, what about you? What else have you seen well, this Well, another thing that we have both watched, we went and saw Ox Venture Live. We did! It yeah, is. Yeah, we saw saw them them adventurers doing a D&D together. Yeah, so this is the uh, Outside Extra, Outside Xbox um, D&D uh, 5e thing, um, run by Johnny Chiodini with the Ox Venturers Guild and... And they, uh, they were haunted by a ghost who had unfinished business. And that unfinished business involved a, 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 a ghost house at a fair. Ooh. An unfinished business. Uh, uh, yeah. It was a very good one shot. It, it was. It had some great puns. Well it, done, everyone. It, it was one of the more kept on track one shots I've seen them do. Uh, yeah, but also, it, like, it wasn't super chaotic, but also it was, you know, it, it managed to do good fun and stay on time, which yeah. I imagine is quite difficult, <laughs> given some of the other shows that they've done as, as, yeah. as live shows, but yeah, it was, it was really good fun, and, um, I am, yeah, I'm, I'm glad I got to say it. Thank you for taking That's me. That's okay. I'm glad yeah. we could do a little it was, it was really good. And uh, first time I've seen an, an Ox Venture Live. Yeah. This is what, your second or third? Uh, one of the two, yeah. <laughs> but it, it's nice we could go together and yeah. see the thing. And if you've not watched any uh, Ox Ventures, it's a good actual play series as well worth yeah. watching. And they, they have like a whole separate YouTube from it now. So if you're not interested in the video game stuff, but you want to listen to some very silly people... Who at the start of this really don't know how to play D and D, <laughs> and some of whom still don't really know how to play D and D. Ah, don't worry about it. To the fact that is one good is is <laughs> like a running joke for that show. Yeah. <laughs> Need to roll me for it. Uh, is one good? <laughs> it's not good. Is it not good? No. Oh no. Pale. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, it was it was a really good show, a really good time, and I uh, would recommend. And I, I hope that there, there is a lot of it at some point. I'm sure there probably will be. Uh -huh. What about you? What have you watched? Ah, uh, I watched a thing on YouTube. <gasps> uh the Great Amazon Heist. Uh, okay. So this Are is. Are we talking about the company or the, the... company okay. Amazon? So. Uh, you might be aware of Uber Butler, who is the person that uh, turned a shed in his garage into the number one rated restaurant on TripAdvisor. Right. Uh, it was the thing he did at one point. Yes, uh, I do remember you he, telling me about this. Yes, he does stunts that usually are poking fun at like corporations and their lack of like oversight for things like their algorithms um, and st corporate bullshit. And... In this, uh, he decides, I'm gonna go and try and find some evidence of Amazon being bullshit. And this becomes a whole big thing with multiple aspects to it. Um, mm. One of which got more media coverage than the others. Uh, but I'll go through them in sort of the order they happen in the documentary. Uh, he manages to get himself hired at Amazon... Uh, it's only like a day before he's rumbled with his like uh, his hidden uh, uh, camera that he's doing undercover recording. Right. Uh, he manages to like get that through the security scanner by claiming to have a screw in one of his testicles. Uh, it's a medical condition. Uh, it's enough room to get that camera in there. Okay. Um, and inadvertently, he gets himself hired. Um, so. He gets himself hired at Coventry's Amazon warehouse, which was trying to unionize at the time, and ends up catching evidence of the fact that Coventry's Amazon warehouse was hiring hundreds of people with minimal background checks, which is how he got hired, right. in order to make the union vote not succeed, because they need 50% of the workers to vote in favor of a union for the union to happen. So they hired like hundreds of extra people so that the threshold the union would need to reach 
Wow. Like, there would be more people they'd need to reach to re- reach the 50% <laughs> threshold. So, he catches evidence of, like, you know, people in poor working conditions, like, you know, uh, that sort of thing. But also, like, gets... Catches evidence of union busting. Mm. Then, uh... He starts a scheme to collect bottles of Amazon driver piss from the road outside of the Amazon warehouse. Oh, um, okay, yes. Yeah. This is the, the drink thing yeah, that you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So we'll, we'll get to that in a sec. But fun fact, Amazon drivers not only have so little time like the, you know, on their shift that they can't afford to go and take a piss break and they've got to piss in a bottle... Um, they get points like deducted for- from them towards being fired if they show up back to the Amazon warehouse and still have the piss bottles in their truck. So but they're not allowed to stop anywhere. Nope. So they throw them out the window like just before they pull into the Amazon warehouse. Right. Uh, so he collects up a bunch of bottles of Amazon driver piss, uh, makes a fake energy drink that is Amazon driver piss called Released. And manages to get it to being the number one rated energy drink on Amazon by gaming the algorithm. This then leads into uh, him proving how easily a four-year-old can purchase a knife on Amazon with no oversight to prove they're 18. Uh-huh. Um, and this, the watchdog that is meant to have, like, fines for Amazon if, like, they sell a knife to a child. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's 5,000... Uh, I think it's 5,000 pounds per infraction and there's like three infractions involved in that process it's they were allowed to purchase the knife uh without being age verified it was transported with no age check and it was put through the letterbox with no age check so one you know knife purchased by a child that successfully gets through the door without an age check is maybe a fifteen thousand pound fine wow so he sat with his four-year-old and six-year-old niece uh and an alexa and uh, got the four-year-old to read out phrases and order as many different knives as possible through the post that did not get age-checked uh-huh. uh, in order to try and rack up huge amounts of fines for Amazon. They can go, this four- and six-year-old successfully purchased this many knives yeah. of different kinds. And then leads into a tax avoidance scam in which he... Orders a bunch of, like, um, the stuff used for filling potholes hmm. off of Amazon. Fills a bunch of potholes, uh, sends them back boxes of sand that weigh the same amount because of their automated, like, uh, refund process that's just looking for the parcel to be the right weight. Oh. Um, which is, you know, a bit of fraud. But... I mean, I've definitely heard about people saying, like, oh, I, I ordered X and I got... Yeah. Something completely different. So... He's like, hey, I'm doing this because they don't pay taxes. But how will I avoid getting sued for fraud? Well, they don't pay taxes because they have a shell corporation they do everything through. Well, what if I buy these bags of uh, material to fill the potholes through a shell company? I I didn't buy them. The shell corporation in the Cayman Islands did. And they were the ones who returned you sand. So, um, potholes got filled Thanks, Amazon. Pay your fucking taxes. Don't use shell corporations to get out of legal responsibility. I mean, if they're not going to pay taxes... Yeah, right. But they do want to use all, all of the, the like the roads and shit. Right, right. Uh, it, is, it is an hour of one man finding every way he can to embarrass and fuck over Amazon. Excellent. And financially and reputationally cause them damage. And I am very here for it. It's well worth a watch. What about you? What have you watched this week? Uh, well, I think that was... The, like, there's not been a lot, I don't think. Yeah. Watching has not been a big thing for me. Uh, that, in fact, is all of my watchings. Uh, it might be all of mine that I can talk about as well. <gasps> uh, yeah, that's everything I can talk about that I watched. Well then! <gasps> Time for this. Hey, Laura! Yes? We've got a new sponsor! Who's our new sponsor? Well, do you... Oh, um... Uh, okay, when there is a new thing... Yeah? Are you like, ooh, a new thing? I Sometimes. I'm gonna have I to get a new novelty. thing. Novel! It's novel! I could get that. It's new. It's that got... will give me like two seconds of dopamine. It's, it's new. It's, it's, got a f- it's got features. Some, I could some, impulse some, buy something new. Some features. Features the new... It's got those. It's top of its class in its product category. What? What, what is it? This, this week's sponsor is 
pro product. Pro product. Get it. Product is new and has features. Yeah. Get product today. Yep. Well, it is new and it does have features. I'm sold. Yeah. Some of the features are even new, apparently. Ooh. Inside the boardroom of Supremacy Software. Hi. Hi. So, uh, I, I, I needed some brainstorming. Sure. So, uh, we acquired the uh, the uh, the team at uh, at Springy, the, right. uh, the, yeah, the yeah. folks that make that uh, that online yeah. live service shooter thing. Yeah, uh, and we acquired them like it's a couple of days off a year. It's going to be a year in a few days. Right, right. And as part of the acquisition, we did promise that staff that stayed on, you know, through the acquisition and stayed for a year would get some shares in the developer. Right. So we have to fire them immediately. Well, yes. We I mean, look, the the, the basic answer is we got to fire them immediately so they don't get the stock cuz we get the stock if they, you know, for any reason yeah. aren't working there. Yeah. But firing them right before they would get stock is a bad move if anyone finds out. So right. Right. I need a brainstorm with you. How can we try and get some of them to leave of their own accord? So that we don't have to do so many firings, so obviously, you know, to, for us. Okay, can we crunch them into absolute, just to the point that they just give up and go? Uh, well, I mean, we've been doing that already and they haven't given up yet. Right. Um, Could we have one of our, our corporate retreats? You know, we'll go paintballing or something. I mean, we can certainly do that, but if we happen to lose any of them in the woods, we won't be able to get them back to do the uh, the firing paperwork. But if they disappear... I mean, we need to, like, conclusively have them not work for us. Right, so right. So, I've, I've been working on an idea. I don't know what you think of this. Right. Um, what if we create a completely identical company right. that is... In all but name, the exact same company. Right. It's the exact same company, but if you if you choose to move from, you know, Springy to Springy 2, uh, you get, like, one extra can of, you know, fizzy drink from the vending machine every right. year. You get an extra Crimson Method per year if yeah. you go and work for Springy with an IE instead oh, of Oh, yeah, rather than a Y. Perfect. And then, you know... By no longer working at Springy with a Y, they, you know, don't get the stock anymore. You are a fucking genius. I know. So, <gasps> what went in your ears? What you listened to? Well, do we want to talk about the thing we listened to immediately before recording first? Sure. <laughs> so, for people who backed the uh, Magnus Archives to the Magnus Protocol... Uh, Kickstarter, what, six months ago, I think it was? Something like that? Something like that. Um, anyone who backed it above a certain level today received access to a preview version of the, a pilot episode. Yeah. Um, they are, like, they haven't finished all the soundscaping on it. Mm. There is sound in it, but it is apparently not the final version. Yeah. And there has been at least one cast member who will not be in the final version that they're going to re-record of the lines for uh but apart from that like the story of that episode is complete and we now know what to expect from the magnus protocol to some degree to to some degree i understand conceptually where this where and when this exists in relation to the magnus archives maybe kind of kind of at least there is at least one reference point of the magnus archives here this here yes but also that doesn't tie with the Magnus Archives. I mean, it doesn't seem to, and I'm curious. Well, I mean, <laughs> maybe. Like, there's there's lots of, like, wider Magnus lore that was never really discussed. Yeah. Like, there's stuff in the Magnus Archives that talks about, uh, obviously you have um, Jonathan Sims, head archivist of the Magnus Archives London, but then you have all that stuff in season four, I think it is, where he goes to America and China and talks to, like, the equivalent uh in in those places yeah and there seems to be like just places in other parts of the world that are recording similar stuff to the magnus archives yes and um yeah it's this is way more office drama than yeah. the first few episodes so, of the magnus archives ever had yeah because we we've talked about the magnus archives before the structure of that show when it starts is Largely self-contained seeming, 
uh, horror story of the week. Yes. And there's a framing device, but it's, like, largely there to get you to, here is the horror story of the week. Yeah, it's, like, the, like the, the best we get in the first episode is, oh, my predecessor is a fucking liability, and um, oh. I, I have been left with all this mess, I have to record am, it onto analog tape. I am a man who must read a story, I will read the story. I will read the story, but also, oh, the mess in here. Yes. And that expands quite dramatically over and the course like, of five seasons. This uh, this first sort of pilot, uh, this first episode for the Ma- Magnus Protocol definitely has a little bit of we're going to read a little horror story. Yes. But it's it's doing a lot more outside of that. And I don't know how much of that is just they're trying to set up a lot of characters. Yes. And, a, um, and a, a whole different world. Yes. We're trying to establish, like, hey, you know we can do horror. We're going to do horror. Let's use this first one to reassure you. There's new characters. This exists kind of, probably in the same world as the Magnus Archives. Mm. And sort of hint at the world that might tie them together, maybe. Yes, maybe. It, it's, there are a lot of questions. Yeah. It seems to be doing a lot of groundwork setting, but there's enough of a tease in there for me to think there will probably be episodes that are... More here is a horror story. Yes. So here we are at the end of October, and I believe sometime at the beginning of January, we are starting the first season of four. I think it is. Hmm. And there's that, like they're saying, it's ready to go weekly episodes from January. Hmm. So uh, exciting. Yeah. Um, don't really know what to expect. I'm fascinated by what any of this means. Yeah, wh- whether it is more Magnus Archives or whether it is something different, I trust these creators and, and I'm excited to give it a shot and see what it be. It certainly is doing creepy reasonably well. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, obviously, only first episode, only only a pilot of the first episode. Um, yeah. Um, I'm excited. I'm excited yeah. to to hear more. Obviously, don't want to talk too much in the way of details just yet. But uh, as especially not until everyone's at least had a chance to listen yeah. to listen to a version of it. But yeah, fascinating. Uh, what about you? What have you listened to? Uh, I listened to a couple of new bits of music I hadn't heard before this week. Uh, I got a nice easy recommendation. A, tr- a track called Turfs Out Ooh. by Problem Patterns. Yes. It's a good sort of like Riot Girl style punk track. Basically going, Turfs, don't pretend you speak for all women. Trans women are not our enemy. Stop co-opting womanhood as a cudgel against trans people. It's good, like, solidarity punk. And I am here for it. It's very good. Go check it out. It, it deserves to be more heard than it is. That's great. Tired comedians trying to stay relevant. Listen to that old hag we used to adore when uh, when he sang The Joke Isn't Funny Anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I I really like that. We So we both encountered this on TikTok. Yeah. Um, and at the time it had like not many views. It's up to about 4,000 views now. Yeah. Uh, album came out on the 27th that yes. that is in. Uh, I have listened to the whole album. I've not listened to the whole album yet. How is it? It's really good. I, I need to do so. I forgot until today when writing this list down that I had heard it and wanted to talk about it. Same. Yeah. Um, uh, it's it's a, it's a good album. The, whole, the album is called um, Blouse Club. It is mm-hmm. available on uh, Bandcamp, among other places. Uh, released on uh, I Love Alco Pop Records. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, they are uh, four people from Dublin who are um, doing great punk stuff. Um, yeah. uh, Poverty Tourist is about... Uh, well, it's, it's basically uh, common people. Y- yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, With a title like that, it had to be. <laughs> Pity Bra is um, <laughs> sort of making reference to going to see a punk band or, or uh, and um, someone throwing underwear <laughs> at the stage and um, being like, "Hey, how come no one throws uh, throws underwear at me anymore? No, I can because uh, I'm not like the the younger uh, acts and someone like offers to throw a bra." And the song is called Pity Bra. I don't need your pity bra. Ah, oh, I think they're playing in London next month. And I, if I went, if if that is the case, and I go to see them, I might have to bring a bra just to throw during Pity Bra. <laughs> they don't need your pity bra. 
<laughs> Are you sure? Here it is. <laughs> uh, Lesbo 3000. <laughs> Um, is uh, about like um, well the, the chorus is call me a dyke it's a badge of honor call me a dyke I'll wear it with pride hell yeah um, and the uh, the opening is about like just the hey we get fetishized yeah. as lesbians but you can fuck off with that shit because we don't exist because of you in fact there is quite a lot in this album yeah. of we don't exist because of you because of how you want to fetishize us yeah or you know uh, or, and there's I can't remember which track it is there is a track about we, we're not just somebody's sister or mother or, or daughter or whatever we, we are people in our yeah. own right so fuck you um <laughs> And the other one I wanted to talk about was uh, Who Do We Not Save? Which is about being angry about um, Check on your friends, they say. Check on your friends. But uh, what do you do when you can't uh, do enough to help them? We pass them the load. Be- we pass the load between us until we self-destruct. We have to bear a system that doesn't care for us. Fuck yeah. I need to listen to this whole album. This whole album is really good. I, I am so thankful to have found this video that had like 200 views on yeah. it and been like, fuck yeah, they're great. Yeah, suggested price on Bandcamp is 8 quid for the whole album, or you Yay. can buy individual tracks for a pound or more. I'm buying that album. Well, I would. Um, yeah, and I think for now at least Bandcamp is still one of the few places that gives the artist most of the money. For the time being. For now. Um, yeah, that, that's... Um, yeah. It's real good. Give it a yeah. listen. Uh, I listened to another track that led me down like an interesting rabbit hole. Okay. Um, I listened to a track called Dark Thought by James Blunt. Aha. Uh-huh. This is a new James Blunt song that was released four days ago at the time of recording. Uh-huh. Um, not an artist I've listened to probably since um, You Are Beautiful or, uh, <laughs> you know. And this, the sound profile of this is a James Blunt song. But I want to talk about the story that leads to this song happening because I it it it, it is a well written song for the thing it is being. Right. So I had no idea James Blunt lived with Carrie Fisher basically since two thousand two. Okay. They lived together for the better part of like fifteen years. Huh. Um, James Blunt like considered Carrie Fisher his best friend. Um, they were very very close. Um. And he's been trying to write a song in her memory since she died, but he's found that very difficult for a few reasons. I mean, she's a big Um, personality, I can see it. Well, she's a big personality, but specifically, like, there is a lot of, like, he will admit very complicated feelings tied up in her death for him. Uh, Because uh, Carrie Fisher's sister blames James Blunt for Carrie Fisher's death. The reason why is Carrie Fisher was using drugs. And... James Blunt, who was living with Carrie Fisher, wasn't taking a hard line, you need to, you need to stop taking drugs, I'm going to shout at you until you just stop taking drugs stance. Right. He was doing the, she's going to take drugs, that is the choice she is making, the thing I can do is not stigmatize that and make sure she's doing it safely. She died, likely in part because of drugs she had taken. And understandably, that led to a lot of the, of James Blunt being like, if I had taken a different approach, if I'd done something different, would she be alive today? Is it my fault she died? Her sister sure seems to think so. I lost my best friend, and I have to worry about whether, in trying to be there for her, I failed to save her. It is a fucking heavy topic. Yeah! And it is a song about that, tied in with the first time he went back and drove past the house they used to live in after she died, and it was up for sale and was being remodelled. And the feeling he had was knowing that, like, the walls she used to have are probably being painted over, like, the things that made this where she lived are not going to be what this house is anymore, Mm. felt like losing her over again. Mm. And it is a song about trying to say goodbye to someone that you don't know if you could have done more to realise how bad a situation they were in, or if you could have done something differently that would have led to them still being here. Yeah. So that is why I say the context is is like obviously like really important to it. It mm. is a really fucking gut wrench of a track, in that it is like it is a beautiful love letter to a person who clearly meant a lot, and a I I 
I don't have the answers on if I could have done anything any differently, but I miss the hell out of you, and I have to live with knowing you're not here anymore. It is a very well-written track, and one that is surprisingly open about complex feelings, that is mm. not trying to go, uh, oh, yeah, Carrie Fisher's sister's entirely wrong for, like, you know, for, for blaming me. It's the, I have to wrestle with that question. Mm. And as much as I think I did the right thing, because, like, the, the way he seems to approach it is, if I had taken that hardline stance, she'd have kept doing drugs, she'd have n not told me about it, she'd have been more secretive about it. I have and potentially ended up taking yeah. more dangerous drugs as a result, I, because you cannot yeah. guarantee... I have to believe I did the right thing, but I have to live with the uncertainty of that. Mm. Um, it is a very interesting, if heavy, song, yes. and one that is like well worth a listen. It is a very interesting piece of art. Um, mm. So yeah, that is James Blunt, Dark Thought. Um, oh. That is quite a piece of music I listened to today. Mm. Um, have you listened to anything else this week? No, that's it. As safe for me as well. Well then, <gasps> time for this. Submitted for the approval of the Scary Story Society. This is the story of the terrifying ghost. It turned out that there was a ghost because someone had died and it was very spooky and ooh. ooh. But then the 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 ghost came and it was haunting a small child who was th about the age of one of us here and it looked a bit like one of us here if this was ever to be rebroadcast in the visual media <sighs> oh. and that's when ha ha i'm gonna break your freaking legs M mouse what are you doing here i'm here to break your legs i i have bought all of the stories daddy owns all of the stories now <laughs> Surely not all of the stories. That's right, all of the stories. We got all of them now. Ha! Oh. We well, this was a new one we made up. Yeah, exactly. We we own all of them in perpetuity, including all the new ones. How? how, how we own the very concept of stories now. Ha! Oh. Disney's all powerful. Uh huh. That's right. This is the real horror of Halloween. Now where's those leggies? Ha! Yeah. Yay! Oh no, corporate consolidation. <laughs> Have you had enough of expensive, fizzy drinks that are just really bad for you? I... I guess... Try the Smelly Bot. It's the only water bottle with a smelly pod that makes it like you're drinking more than water. So your brain is a fool, because your brain is a fool and will make your brain pay money. That's right, it's about $15 a minute for a single-use plastic smelly pod. But it's not just any water bottle, oh no, it's a smelly bot. Get yours today and start catching a whiff of your smelly bot with smelly bot. Smelly bot. It's not just water. I'd rather not. Smell the bot. Smell no. the bot. Smell the bot bot. Do you know what I want to see more of? What do you want to see more of? Brochure Justice Warriors. Brochure Justice Warriors? Yeah. Alright, Larry. Alright, Larry. How are you doing? Uh, I have had uh, an invasive procedure. Oh, well, that's and, all fun. Uh, honestly, my, my throat is a bit wrecked, so uh, I might uh, oh, that's keep all right. today's we'll, talk. Uh, we'll, keep, we'll keep our chat quick and have, yeah, have a cup of tea on for you. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you might have to get the kettle on. You know. <laughs> uh, yeah, how you doing, mate? You all oh, right? I've been all right this week. I've just been, <laughs> uh, I've been uh, watching the annual Halloween... Uh, a uh, fear mongering routine oh, pop yeah, up. Yeah. You, well, uh, yeah, well, well, we're talking about the old old paganism. Oh no, no, not that one. It was, oh, well, that has been happening, obviously. Yeah. Have you seen any of this Jesus wing that was uh, allegedly being... Uh, no, but I am not surprised to see Jesus wing be a thing. That mm -hmm. does not surprise me knowing that churches... I'm, of course, talking about the annual tradition of... Oh, people everywhere are putting drugs in the sweets to drug your kids. Right, There's yeah, LSD yeah. in the Mars bars. Oh, I'm loving it. I'm there's, not full of there's, LSD. There's cocaine in the Skittles. <laughs> oh, my God. I might give those a miss. Are you sure it's not just the sugar? <laughs> oh, yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's, it, look, this happens every year, and 
you know, it's easy to joke about it and to go, no one's giving away their drugs for free. Why would they're they not, do they're that? Not, they're not cheap. You no. Know. You I, the, the one I always remember seeing, you know, back when I was a kid was, uh, oh, they're putting ecstasy pills in, in the sweets. Don't, you know, don't get any individual sweets if you're out trick-or-treating because, oh, it's it's probably uh, pro- probably MDMA and it'll kill you. And, you know, the... Press was boiled about MDMA at the time, anyway. Yeah, yeah. So no one is putting uh, no. a ten ten pound a pill in, uh, in, yeah. in 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 some kid's bag. Well, like you know, there's the obvious things of a. If someone has drugs, they're gonna have they're gonna consume the drugs, not give them away. Yeah, you know. Yeah. B. Drugs are expensive. They ain't giving them away. Yeah. For, you, know. Probably, you know, anyone who has drugs will probably be too high and paranoid to open the door to a bunch of vampires. Oh, or them. Yeah, uh, you know, no one wants to give a kid drugs and then the kid eats the sweets that are drugs and then gets very ill and goes, that's the house that gave me that weird sweet. And, you know, now you're arrested for, you know, giving kids drugs. No one's doing that. And you have a reputation as, as the, the one who, who drunk made the that child sleep for several hours. Yeah. But that being said, like it's easy to talk about these points. I think yeah. it is worth noting, like the thing that sometimes gets left out of this annual discussion is why this happens. Oh, and, right. you know, yeah. part of it is news media loves to have a thing to fear monger about. Well, yeah, yeah. Uh, but part of it is very, very deliberate. Uh, a lot of it is to do with police forces wanting an excuse to drum up fear about drugs to get more funding. Right, uh, you yeah. see, you see this a lot in America with like uh, the rainbow fentanyl uh, scare from a couple of years ago. They're I all, hearing about that. They're, they're putting food coloring in the fentanyl to put it in your kids' uh, Halloween sweets. Uh, and everyone which is, is not- weird because America has a lot of places where you know at least cannabis is is reasonably legal. So you know. Yeah. And we do have, like, adult versions of Sour Patch Kids and so forth well, these days. Well, I mean, there is that too. But, like, you see a lot of these, like, when this comes up in America, the story is accompanied by a local police chief that is like, we need more uh, support to fight fight the war on drugs to save the kids from Halloween drugs. Oh, right. And, like, a big part of this is, if you're scaremonger about kids getting given drugs at Halloween, it's a good excuse for you to remind people we should be allowed to go after the drugs. Oh, see, in America, I assumed a decent chunk of it was uh, probably um, racism, because I have heard, you know, about, oh, my kids went to the Mexican family down the street, and they were given, uh, is it tamarind lollies? Oh, yeah, yeah. This is quite popular uh, in in, uh, in like, South America, or, or, or like Mexico and, and below. And as a result, like, uh, you know, if, if you happen to be, you know, from a different part of America originally or have family from different places, you are getting sweets that perhaps, you know, if you are a white person from the whitest place of, of whiteness and you have never experienced anything outside of a Mars bar or m ms <laughs> then, you know, you, you are, oh, you, you, oh, what's this? It wasn't even properly wrapped. Oh, the terror. Yeah, yeah. And it's all, it, it, look, it, it's all ultimately fear mongering with whatever your purpose happens to be, whether it's yeah. get views on your, your news or scare about a group or get more money in the yeah, police's yeah, hands. Yeah. And, you know, no one's giving away drugs to kids, but also. Be aware of the the reason why we hear this every year. Yeah, yeah well, yeah. Um, thank you for educating me, mate. Yeah, it's all right. Where's the hug? Oh, yeah. 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 You don't wake. You don't Right, I think I'll pop the kettle on. Sounds lovely. Yeah, it's nice. So, Laura, yes. tell us about your new book. What? Stories of Autistic Joy? That one that you're also in? I am in that, yeah. It's an anthology of stories from our autistic people around the world talking about joy and what forms it takes for them that might be unique to them as autistic people. Go check it out. It's out now. Uh, end of this month, I think 20... 20- 8th of November, I would have to double check that, but end of, end of November, uh, Gender Euphoria is coming out as an audiobook. Hell yeah. I Who's went, that read by? That's read by me. Well, I sat in a little studio for like three days and read a book. Occasionally and voices you, came through the, the thing. Oh, you missed, you missed, or oh, you've, you flubbed a, a pronunciation, so I'll say that line again. 
And then words are going to happen. So yeah. look forward to that in uh, end of the end of November. Yeah, and they did a nice job making the cover of the book into the cover of a, a like a CD style. Yeah, they they took a rectangle and made it a square quite effectively. Yeah. Um, so yeah, other than that, Laura K. Buzz pretty much everywhere. Just search Laura K. Buzz, you'll find me on all the things. What about you? Uh, well, I don't have the unified branding, so I have a link tree to, to act as a, as a crutch for that. It's linktr.ee slash chaniac, J-A-N-E-I-A-C. You can find, um, uh, Twitch, Twitch, YouTube, or all, all of the things my mastodon. Uh, you can find the t-shirts I design, the music I make, and this very podcast. Uh, yeah, I think that's all of the important things. Oh, patreon.com slash stonefunkyradio for as little as a dollar a month. You can help me justify terrible life choices and a lack of sleep. Uh, yeah. Uh, Laura, will you sing us out, please, darling? Until next time, be a stranger. <laughs>